Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Woolly Thistle Shopcast. It is pouring rain, it's very Scottish outside today, which kind of excites me when it's once in a while. When it's once in a while, sure. But I think it's here for the week. We have... I'm, I'm not looking at that far ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm your host, Corinne, and here's my co-host, Maggie. Hello. And we are here to talk about all things wonderful and wooly and I'm wearing wool. I know. I'm so excited. I am too, but it's on my feet. Okay. You got socks on. I got my socks on, yeah. <laughs> it's so good to put the woolies back on and dig them out of the, you know, the, the chest or the yeah. wherever it is. Yes. So what do we have going on today, Maggie? Or should we, what, what do we want to start with? Because um, I'm just going to let you in on a wee secret here. It's Monday morning and my day has already gone right off the rails. <laughs> completely so i'm just trying to grab it back here so yeah. yes um all good stuff is just you know the way the way things go they don't go as yeah. planned which is very <clears> annoying <throat> so maggie what are we talking about <laughs> well um if you're new here uh the woolly thistle is an online yarn store yes. um specializing in woolly wool yes um especially from the uk and scandinavia yes for sure we love that woolly wool non superwash for the most part um small producers for a large part uh, mm -hmm. independent mills independent authors and we have all their books it's it's really a treasure trove here yeah of wonderful wooliness so yes if yeah. you're new here welcome if you're not new here thank you for being here and coming back yeah it's good to see you first of all there are no ads on this video we used to run ads we no longer run ads but we ask that you help support the show and all that it takes to get this out um, by coming and visiting us at thewoollythistle.com. That would be great. Um, Maggie, tell them about the PIPS program when they shop with us. So when you shop with us, um, we have a new loyalty rewards program that when you shop, you earn PIPS. And those PIPS turn into money and basically free yarn for you. And we call them <laughs> PIPS because they're points in progress, just yeah. like your whips. So whips and PIPS. Um, yeah, so yeah, and to earn your pips, all you have to do is create an account on the website and be logged in when you're shopping, and then and it goes straight that's in. It. It's yeah, straight in. And people are really loving it. We're yeah. seeing people both uh, earning pips and redeeming pips, and it's all good. So that is good. We also want to mention that we love hearing from you, so definitely leave comments for us down below and have a good read of them too. They're, they brighten the day, they're just wonderful comments. Yes. But in addition to that, if you would like to appear here on the Wooly Thistle in your own segment. We love to send out that invitation and all you need to do is share your whips or your FOs, tell us what you've knitted and yarn from the Wooly Thistle, send in the video. There is a form for submitting that in the shop and so yes, just pitching that if you're interested. We love hearing from our community and we have had a few already come through and be on the Shopcast, which is yep. lovely. Um, who do we have on the Shopcast today? So today's episode features segments from Emma, um, who is Barnaby Knits. Yep. Um, She's a regular contributor. She is a regular contributor. She yep. has her own podcast as well. Yep. Um, Kelsey, uh, who is our knitting expert extraordinaire. And it's we're going to have a knitting yoga with Kim segment. Um, and also we have an interview with Deborah um, of Arms Coat Manor. Yes, so we have a very full episode, which means Maggie, we have to limit how much talking we do. Or, and we have to talk faster. We'll try to go fast. Yes, because we, we don't... can't talk too fast. But no, yes. but we'll try. We'll try. What do we want? Should we give away a prize? We should first? start with a winner because we're really bad. If we skip the winner, I know we'll we'll go off the rails. Yeah. So just to keep on track. Yes. Um. Uh, every episode, if you're new here, every episode we give away at least one or two twenty-five dollar gift cards to the Woolly Thistle. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is uh, like and subscribe and leave a comment below. Yep. And the winner, one of the first winner from last week's. The last episode it wasn't last week anyway last episode yes was at rebecca mccoyer 165 and she Hooray! said is it autumn yet lol my wool stash is too big for temperatures this high does anyone have a fan pattern lol <laughs> I, I feel you rebecca um, yeah. <laughs> that last heat wave did me i'm i'm good now oh good because um, that was awful <laughs> so rebecca if you can email us at info at the woolly thistle.com put prize winner in all caps and we will quickly get you your 25 dollar gift card to the woolly thistle yes and if you want to be in the running yourself <laughs> for uh being drawn at random for a prize just leave a comment below 
uh, give us a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to the Wooly Thistle channel here. So congratulations, Rebecca. That's exciting. Uh, what do we have going on now? Uh, what, what, now we want to know what about? you're wearing. So I am wearing, this is the Cockatoo Bray by Kate Davies. I think I knitted this in 2015. I wore it to EYF my first time I went to Edinburgh Yarn Festival in 2016 okay and there was a sea of cockatoo braids it was lovely so this is mine i knitted this in um harrisville shetland which is oh you can see i've worn through oh and i need to do some darning again but i've got a little love heart in the sleeve there because there's a hole there and also over here <laughs> that's so cute yeah so i want to keep wearing it so i am just going to decorate it up you know, yeah keep mending it keep mending it so um but i was going to say this this uh yarn actually does wear like iron but i think my sleeves i mean were but too 2015 narrow. that's eight years too. yes I mean, and but i think i think what really kind of got it going though is that my sleeves are too narrow for my arms so the yarn is already under stress and okay. then the elbows so but otherwise it does not pill um and then i think i mean like the color work, like most of it other no than pills. the elbows it looks yeah you would not think it was right as old as it is. my buttons are from katrin coles i love these these are i think bamboo and most of the color work was done with harrisville uh shetland or jameson and smith this was done before the woolly thistle was in the world so I still love this sweater and it was so exciting to put it on today yeah. because it's pouring rain and it's not too hot. So that nice. was good. And you're wearing socks today? I'm wearing socks. I'm not going to. Not going to show us? I'm not limbered up this morning. I'm not going to show you that, but uh, just so socks. Just socks. <laughs> socks. So, and um, we, we are in the middle of our yeah. sweater cow. Yeah. We're at least halfway through now. Yeah. Um, Maybe and a bit more. So that's what I've been working on is a sweater. Me too. Do you want to, do you want to show? I'm so excited. Let's yes, have a look. I'm, 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 I'm in the home stretch, guys. All right. So <laughs> oh, I've think... been using Wool Dreamers Moda. It's so lovely. For Just... anybody new here, I'm knitting the Building Blocks cardigan by Amy Schur, and I'm on oh. the button bands, guys. Oh my gosh! <sighs> so this is all cinched because it's on one needle. It, yeah, that's why. That's why. I kind of like all... that as a design element, though. Yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, it's lovely. It feels so <gasps> nice. So I actually blocked the body of the sweater. Oh, it's lovely. And the one sleeve, because I wanted to make sure before I did the second sleeve. So the sleeves are knit flat oh in order goodness. to stay consistent in your gauge. Wow. Um, so oh, I like since the little it detail. Was, yeah, so my daughter, the sweater's for my daughter, and she wanted um, a little ribbing, like a contrast color. Is this the first cream. time you've ever knitted sleeves flat? Because I don't think I have ever. I don't think I've ever... Maybe, like, that's not true. I've knit, like, baby cardigans. Sure. Like, I've knit the February baby sweater a few times. That's one of my go-tos. Yeah. Um, and so, the sleeves are flat on that. So but. you picked up... Did you do your... Did you join your shoulders before or after? Mm -hmm. She tells you to join the shoulders with a three-needle bind-off. And, and then... And then pick up stitches. Yep. And then you pick up stitches. And In you, the flat. There is a short little sleeve cap with short rows. And oh. then it's just... Gorgeous. And some, some decreases. So, but you could see, like, I was a little concerned about the fit just because yeah. it, it rolls in so much. It looks narrow. Um, <laughs> this is why we don't knit flat scarves. <laughs> yes. Um. So I blocked that one to make sure I like the fit of it and before I did the second one. Um, it's so teeny tiny. I know. So it's, it's lovely. It's, this wool is beautiful. Yeah. And this is, uh, I think, too, Mota. it looks tinier because of the way it's yeah. cinched. So I did the actual buttonholes last night. I think maybe one of the last times you but knitted. But it's weird. I got, like, a little bumpy there. So I may block it to see. Does oh. that work? Like, it's, like, this weird little... I don't know if just maybe I didn't snug it tight. It yeah. looks weird. Yeah, I don't but it, know. And it's consistently at the end of like most of the buttons. So I'll take a look at it. This tonight. is reminding me of your textured, you know, that sort of um, burgundy color um, cardigan you knitted. But the weight of it was so different because that was worse. Yeah, so that's a, that was knit with like a bulkier yarn okay. and but it was a worsted. And it was so, it was so heavy, heavy. Whereas this is lovely and light. Yeah. But very, very Oh, chunky. And yeah, so gorgeous. I've been knitting this with Wool Dreamers Mota. Mm. Um, I really like it. Good. I, I think she's going to love it. Yes, um, she'll wear the heck out of it. Hopefully you'll be patching the so, elbows. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, like, that's the goal, yeah. um, is that she really is able to wear it for a long, long time. It's a comfort. 
it's a comfort knit and a comfort wear. Yeah. So her. I'll probably buy her a, a little, small bottle of eucalyptus to there go with go. it because even last night she's like, so this can't go in the washing machine right now. I was like, oh my gosh. God, no. No. <laughs> like, not if you want to live. Soak it in the sun, honey. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and honestly, while she's at school, um, I'm like, you shouldn't really need to no. wash it while you're in the yeah. dorm. Unless you spill something on it yeah. or anything like that, but yeah. you know, it's a whole different thing. God, I feel like I'm getting drawn into this. Yeah. I'm very excited. Yeah, when you knit with wool, pure wool, you don't have to wash it. Uh, all this thing about oh, I don't, I'm scared of wool because I, you, you know, you got to wash it special. Right. No, you just soak it in water, and if it's sunny out, you put it out in the sunshine to get all that fresh air, and it's yeah. self cleaning. You yeah. don't need to put it in the washing machine. Right. So. Right. Lovely job. It's I'm I'm really happy with this. And guys, because I know you guys it's so even. My knitting is so <laughs> even. That's right. And I've been Norwegian pearling this whole baby now. I can even do it without watching. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, so. whenever you're trying to learn a new technique, it's really good to make yourself do it on one project. Yeah. You know? All right, here is my whip right this is now. Beautiful. Oh I really love this. Do you? Mm hmm I'm liking it more and more and more. So I've just finished this sort of dark purple motif. I've got the light purple. It reminds me of violets. You know those violet, palm of violet things mm -hmm. that you used to eat as a kid? Old ladies would give you it. That's what this <laughs> reminds me of. So I've got another round to do of that background, but I think I might be going, um, I may be going back to the pink. I'm not sure. Well, so I was going to ask, like, do you have a color plan? Like, do you think no. you're going to boomerang back to dark? I like, don't, yeah. Where, I, what do you want at the neckline? I really, I don't know. I really don't know. And it depends whatever I can find in my stash. I, you know, I started out with an idea of colors, but I had so many more light colors than dark colors. Right. So I don't know. I'm just playing with that. I really don't know. That's me okay. to tea, though. I just That's okay. cross that bridge when I get there. But I am happy with how it's looking. I'm... I just cast on my um, sticks for the arms. Nice. So we're there and there, and I've got the stick up the front, which you can see. And yeah, I, I am really enjoying the knitting of this. And you see, I kind of went a little bit rogue. So I've kind of had one row of brown and then two rows of purple, but changing the motif, mm -hmm. and then two rows of this rusty okay. color. But then I only did one orange because I felt like that was enough and then I went to this lighter color and changing the motif darker so I really am just playing and I think I'm gonna like it so that's that is um no shaping on the body at all it's just straight up and down um and the sleeves look quite voluminous so I might be messing with the shaping of the sleeves when I get okay. there but really enjoying it. I don't need the pattern for this at all. I, I can put this down and pick it up and know exactly what to do. It's so easy that way. And nice. no catching floats. There's one round where I catch floats, but the rest of the time it's just really fast. Do you want to see inside? I'll show you. Yeah. So that's what it's looking like inside. It's always so fun to see it on the reverse. I know. Yeah. And you can see I've joined. That's where I'm joining. Got my sticks there. Nice. Stick down the front. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm really enjoying knitting it and I'm enjoying the color play. And of an evening I can get through one section, you know, so okay. it doesn't take too too long. Kind of sick of it by the time I've finished and then ready to start a new color sequence, which is fun. Yeah, that is fun. Yeah, so I'm going to now I'm gonna keep knitting in the round now that I've cast on my sleeve steaks. And if you haven't done steaks for sleeves. Basically, you know, you, Don't mind me. <laughs> <laughs> you're knitting a tube up to here and then you, if you want to knit back and forth, then you wouldn't have sticks. But to continue knitting in the round, you need to have the bridge for here. So I've just cast those on. They're nine stitches each. And that gets me to continually knit in the round. Okay. Up and then, then we'll do one for the next. Are the sleeves then picked up and knit down or are they yeah. knit separately and sewn in? No, the first one. Okay. And they'll be shaping to bring it into the neck. And then there'll be a neck stick as well. So you can keep knitting smaller and smaller circumferences. Okay. Yeah. So um, I've done this a couple of times now where I've, you know, had, or maybe once before, I can't remember. The first time I steeped, I had neck, sleeves, but no front. It was a sweater. Okay. That's what it was. So yeah, it's really good fun. It keeps you knitting in the round and happy as 
happy as a clam. That's all I've got to show, though. I don't have much else to show right now. Yeah, that's that's all I have. Yeah. Um, it's nice though. Like I'm cruising up on the end of this project much faster than I thought yes, it would you be. Yes, are. Like I really thought when when Jillian oh. asked me when it would be done, I was like, oh, maybe by end of October. Like when, and when we it's come. not even. And yeah, the I'm, of I'm like, oh, um, DK, wait, <laughs> who knew? <laughs> it's just flying off the flying off the needles. So, and I've been really monogamous. Like I'm still working on rows of my the blanket to move that along. Yeah. Um, but really, I've just been working on this. Are sweater. you starting to think about your next knit then? Yeah. So now, uh, like, I'm I'm sort of in, I'm surprised how much I've been in, okay with enjoying the flat knitting mm -hmm. um and there's an isolde cardigan i've had in my Which one? library i don't remember the name of it we'll, we'll put it here um but it's knit in i love the look of it i think it would be a cardigan i would throw on all the time and it's got pockets this is a stock something it's not stock bridge okay. it's a different one um there used to be a community member i don't know if she still hangs out here but i remember years ago there were, during our sweater cow she knit one and she'd knit like five of them oh um, just want to wear it all the time yeah fingering or it is fingering and i'm thinking of using sauna <gasps> um Lovely. because then that would get me like i feel like sauna definitely from from all of your feedback yeah. it leads more wooly than it's a 50 50 wool cotton wool dreamer but it's yarn. a wooly cotton but it's cotton. very wooly and yeah. i feel like in these um in between seasons i would get a lot yeah, of yeah. out of it and yeah. since i'm cruising along with knitting flat right now fun um so fun. i'm tempted to hey I'm just Too thinking bad. we have to let everyone know about the bunting. Yes. So where are we at with the bunting? Because we got so much of it and I do feel bad that we haven't shown it yet. Yeah. So for our birthday, for anybody who is new here, for our birthday celebration back in July, um, we asked all of you to knit little triangles for a bunting that we are putting together. And you guys did. And as we speak here, our um, staff members, so we took a lot of time opening them all up. You guys sent a generous amount, which was awesome. Thank so you. we opened them all up. Um, every single bunting that was sent with like a card of who knit it and what yarn they used, that has been... Um, we use little stitch markers to, to attach. attach it so that we always have that information. Um, and then we're using stitch markers to join them in a nice little row. Yeah. Um, and some will be ha be hung back in for where fulfillment is so that they can see all your beautiful work. And then some will be put. So up. when do we think that'll be done by? So, so I'm hoping by the next episode, video. we can at least um, attach some video showing you yeah. where we've hung it in the back. Yes. Um, the front area is still sort of under construction. Um, yes. But we, I, I do think that we should hang some. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. Put some up there so yes. that you can see it when yes. we record. Thank you. Thank you so much it was absolutely a delight i don't think i've even seen them all yet there was so many of them i had the uh, joy and privilege of opening many of them not all of them um and it was so fun it was so yeah. fun it was just talk about happy mail it yeah. was so fun to just yes thank you for um, helping us celebrate yeah. that way i'm really looking forward to showing you and we'll we'll get that done next time yeah for sure okay so and have you been knitting along with us in the cow? Have you finished? Because there's lots of FOs starting to pop up, isn't mm -hmm. there? Yeah. Oh, and um, there is an FO form. We're doing things a little bit differently um, this year. In order to make it really easier and more fair in selecting prizes, we certainly encourage you posting your finished sweaters in either our Facebook and or Ravelry group or on Instagram wherever you're joining us for the cow. But we are also, we also have a new form on the website where you can so submit your FO in order to be prize eligible. Yes. That makes the prize winning process much smoother. Yes. Um, cause because find, tracking down all yes. of the finished objects and making sure that we see all of them. Um, it's very easy on Ravelry, but um, our Facebook group, there are so many of you there and it's so awesome. Um, but the platform itself doesn't make it easy to right. make sure we're seeing all of your FOs. So, yes. So that we can feel confident that we're seeing all your work and you're all in the running. Um, we ask that you submit Where that Where do they form. find the form? Um, on the website? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think, under the connect. <laughs> I think I always said that like a question. It's on the website. <laughs> well, and I'm sure know. we have it linked in both groups as well. Yes. So, so if, yes. if you're looking for it and you can't find it, you can also send us an email at info at the Woolly Thistle. Yep. Or you can post a comment in one of our groups and we will get back to you. Yes. Yes. But uh, definitely do that because then you'll be in the running for a prize, which yeah. we have some wonderful prizes. Marie Wallen again is donating um, a kit, the cat bells, I believe. Yeah. And we have some books from, let's see, I'm thinking off the top of my head, um, 
it's Kristen Drysdale. Kristen Drysdale, oh, yeah, yeah ebooks, I think, and I think, yeah, all kinds of good stuff. So yeah. lots of lovely prizes. So hopefully you're knitting along. We still have time, and you know maybe we'll all get to wear our new sweaters to Rhinebeck if you're going. We're planning. Uh, to, a lot of us are planning to be there from mm -hmm. the Woolly Thistle, so we'll be at the podcaster meetup for sure and uh, get to meet you or say hello there or, you know, just hope you're there. Hopefully the weather's good and it's not too warm. <laughs> it's not too warm, not rainy. Not rainy would Please be good not too. Rain. Yes. It's usually <laughs> beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. It usually is. We usually get lucky. I hope we didn't just jinx it. I'm so sorry. Touching wood. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. What else do we need to... <laughs> Oh yeah, the show notes. There you go. We haven't done any videos yet. Oh, we, let's go to a video. Um, so I'm going to admit, um, I did not have time to preview Kelsey's video, but we're going to go to we'll Kelsey's right together. Now, and yeah, I'm yeah. sure she'll be delightful. Yeah. See you on the other side. Hi, it's Kelsey again. I just wanted to come in and talk to you a little bit about using up scraps. Um, it's something that some of you may be thinking about or already doing um, when you're knitting your sweater cowl sweaters, especially if they're color work, or even if they're not color work and you get towards the end of the of the body of the sweater and you have, you know, two thirds of all, three quarters of all, five grams of a ball, whatever it is left, um, what can you do with it? What do you wanna do with it? There are some knitters who certainly don't use their scraps and that's completely fine. Um, everybody has their own thing and they have everything that they wanna do with their with their yarns and their scraps. Um, every project can be fresh. You can buy a new yarn for every single project and that's, that's great. Um, but the nature of knitting is that it has to be sold in a certain amount. So it has to be sold in, for example, it has to be sold in this size skein or this size skein or this size ball. You're never really going to get exactly what you need unless you play some really serious yarn chicken, which is, you know, you're braver than I am. So what you end up with if you're not doing that and sort of hitting right on the money is something like this. This is my bucket. <laughs> my bucket of little bits and pieces. And it feels, this is looks very empty, but these are the smallest ones. <laughs> there are a lot of other ones that are like, say, this size that are a partial skein that I don't put in the little bucket. Um, these are things that are, you know, kind of nugget sized our little weird things of mohair and linen and little scrappy bits of who knows what that is anymore. Um, so I have that bucket and I have also a little box that I actually keep my um, Jameson and Smith two ply jumper weight, um, Jameson spindrift, um, Uradale four ply, like things like that that are Shetlandy. Um, either actually Shetland or sort of Scotland and, and woolen spun and the whole thing that has a very similar weight and texture um, and come in a lot of colors. So it's easy to kind of put together all of your different blues or, you know, part of a ball of purple or like this yellow versus, where'd it go? This yellow, um, you know, so I have both of those in this bucket and I don't have to search through my other bucket <laughs> or honestly, I have another basket and we're not going to talk too much about the rest of the yarn. But I put my little bits in, in separate little baskets. And something that I have found to be invaluable in using, especially like, where's that one I was just holding up? This guy. Like, I know it's a mess. I'm sorry. It's probably offending people. But it doesn't weigh very much. It's not very much yarn. Like, if you look at, let me see, this is almost a full skein of Jameson and Smith. And this is just a little bit, it's a little bit. And considering this is already only 25 grams, this is not very many grams. So how do I figure out how long this is? Luckily, Jameson and Smith is 125, I think it's yards. Yeah, 125 yards per 25 grams. So that is five yards per gram. So 125 yards divided by 25 grams is five yards per one gram just doing like reducing the fraction kind of doing the math out you know a lot of the yarns are much weirder numbers but that one is super easy um but it's a good way to visualize like five to one yards to grams for jameson and smith the same is true with spindrift it is pretty close with uradale i don't think it's exactly right i'm looking down because i have a big pile here that i'll show you in a second um but 
If you have something else that's say 200 yards to 50 grams, 200 yards to 50 grams would be four to four yards to one gram. So that's thicker than this. 200 divided by 50 <laughs> equals four. So the number of yards divided by the number of grams will give you the number of yards per gram. Yeah. So what do I do with that information? Okay, so what? This is five yards per gram. How do I know, what do I do with that? Enter the kitchen scale. I feel like I've talked about this before, but I think it is so important that I want to talk about it again before I move on to something a little bit related. This is a kitchen scale. I got it at a kitchen supply kind of store. You can get them on Amazon. You can get them at local stores. You can get them at Target. You can get them all sorts of places. Um, about 20, 20 to 30 bucks will get you a, a really good, a really well rated one. I think this one is somewhere in that like 20, 22, 25 range. You can get much more expensive ones and you can get much cheaper ones. Um, this one I like especially because it does measure in grams and it's getting upset because I'm tipping it up. But you can see you can change ounces over here, pounds and ounces or grams. So that one is pounds and ounces. Oops, that one is ounces and that one is grams. So it's getting mad, so I'm gonna put it back down. But what I can do is take my little blue chunk here, put it on, see how many grams it is. Two, two grams. Yeah, so it's two grams. So five yards per gram, two grams, 10 yards. Not very many, but could definitely be used in something, especially with the color that it is, it's kind of bright. And especially with, um, Fair Isle, when you have like a gradient and then that middle line is a brighter color or a darker color, um, or if you need just a few lines in a gradient, especially for like a hat or for mitts or something, I will be able to use that at some point. More useful sizes, you know, this guy is, okay, it's only four, but still, <laughs> um, 20 yards for this one. So you can start, but then you also can do like, um, this one looks like a full ball. It's not 22 so it's 22 instead of 25 so you can keep track of your yarn that way and it's helpful when patterns tell you instead of just like three balls or four balls it'll say the actual number of number of yards those are usually rounded up by about 10 percent um, so if you really want to cut it close you can kind of fudge it a little bit lower than the numbers that are offered in a pattern um, but to be safe get to that pattern number and a, and a little bit higher um, a lot of Fair Isle patterns will not necessarily give you the number, um, especially if they're designed in a particular yarn because they're trying to sell you those, those balls of yarn and that's totally understandable. You know, yarn companies can't be putting out patterns um, willy nilly without <laughs> getting sales back from that. So it makes sense, but just know that there are a lot of patterns, especially like if you're looking at a hat or something that has five, six, seven colors. There's no way that that hat is gonna weigh more than like 50 grams or so. Um, so you're in a figuring weight, so you're not really going to need, you know, 20 grams each of six or seven colors. So you may be able to get away with scraps, especially if you're okay with um, fudging the pattern a little bit towards the top. But then that's just, that's just me. I'm, I wanna use up my scraps. Um, some people wanna follow the pattern colors exactly. Um, which all power to you, perfectly fine. Um, but I'm a person who likes to do little scrappy bits here and there. And on a previous episode, I showed my Busta beanie that has like, it loses the color in the middle of a repeat and or in the middle of a triangle shape. And I think it looks great. Um, you wouldn't know that that wasn't what it was designed to be. So the related thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit more is mixing and matching yarns. So I talked about how um, Jameson and Smith two ply jumper weight. Jameson's of Shetland, who's a, that's a different company than Jameson and Smith. Um, Spindrift. Those are nearly identical yarns. Um, they are both Shetland wool. They are both two ply. They are both about 125 yards per um, 25 grams. And they are what did I already say? They're from Shetland, um, from Shetland Crofters, and they come in a huge range of colors, both of them. So I have no hesitation knitting those together. But I also have no hesitation knitting a ton of other ones together. And I just wanted to show you some of those. Um, I've kind of put them in two piles on the floor here so that you get a sense of things that are a little bit, a little bit different. And you know, maybe you need to be a little bit braver to mix together. Um, 
but easy ones. This is Uridale 4 ply, easy to mix, almost identical to those other two, um, Jameson and Jameson and Smith and Jameson's. Um, another is Sheep Shop. Sheep Shop Tweed. Um, it actually lists itself, I think it says 126 yards, just to be a little bit different. 126 yards to 25 grams. It also comes in these kind of donuts. Um, this is also the yarn that's in the uh, Christmas box this year, the holiday box this year. So this is a good one. And you can always take those skeins, these little balls, these little cakes or donuts that are in the box and mix them with your stash of JNS or of Jameson's or of Uridale or whatever. And it is nearly identical in knitability. It comes in all these really cool sort of heathered colors. It's a really, it has a really nice feel to it. So that's one that's super easy to mix. Um, where am I going now? Another one, these, these ones that I'm gonna show you now are on the slightest bit thinner, the slightest bit thinner. Um, but I would have no, zero qualms. Like when I say the slightest, I mean the slightest. Uh, this is Lamelgarn by Rauma. This is in the flower, the second version of the Flowers of Fortros patterns. So that's why, because they are so similar. They come in, again, different colors because it's a different yarn company. It's Norwegian wool, so it's a little bit of a different wool, but it feels, I mean, it feels very similar, especially because Lamel Garn is lamb wool yarn in Norwegian. Um, so it's it's soft and, and nice. It's sort of, it's like the JNS or the um, Jameson's where it's rustic-ish, but wooly and nice. Um, another is Too Cool. Too Cool Fingering is um, Finnish wool. Um, it's 200 meters to 50 grams. So 100 meters to um, 25 grams. And this now I'm mixing my, my meters and my, so the jumper weight is 115 meters. So this is actually 100 meters um, to 25 grams. So actually this is a tiny bit thicker. Now I'm getting my piles mixed up. But see, that's my point. These things could knit together so easily. It's also wooly. It's also kind of springy. I believe it's also, it looks like it's also a two ply. You know, go crazy. Especially when we occasionally have things that are out of stock, like maybe one of these is out of stock, but we have a similar color in this one or vice versa. Um, you can always go look in other yarns. Another is actually Gamelseri. Gamelseri technically has less yardage, but it is spun tighter, so it is thinner than like fennel garn, which I'll get to in a second. So fennel, uh, Gamelseri and lamel garn are similar in thickness of the yarn, so they knit really well together. Um, the texture of the Gamelseri has a tiny bit of a tight, is a, it's, a, it's a tighter twist in the yarn, so it is a denser yarn, but again, those two can go together. They can also go with JNS. Um, some others that I have on the ground here that are simple and easy subs. This is actually Rambler. This is our um, the Woolly Thistle Rambler. I believe this color is called. Now I'm getting all turned around. This one is Lichen. Sort of a sa light sagey green color. I would knit these that with any of these. Um, this is Biche Bouche Le Petit Lambs Wool. I believe this is called orange brown or rust orange, orange brown, I think is right. Again, thin, two ply. Um, I think it's Scottish. I think it's even Scottish wool or it's at least spun in Scotland. Maybe it's Norwegian wool. Um, I know it's a French company, but it's a Norwegian family in France. So it's a lot of moving parts. Um, so yeah, Rambler, Biche Bouche. Hmm? Biche Bouche with Jameson Smith. Yes, good. What else do I have down here? These are a couple that we don't have right at the moment. Um, this is Border Mill, uh, Nor Border Mill North Coast Tweed. It's a little bit on the thicker side. It's very similar to um, Marie Wallen's British Breeds that I don't have in front of me, but it's a similar sort of yardage and actually similar yarn construction to Marie Wallen's British Breeds. So if you have any of this, a few years ago we had um, big boxes of all the colors. We've also sold it by the ball. Um, any of this, Border Mill, you can knit with Marie Wallens. Uh, Marie Wallens, you can also knit with Fennel Garn. This is the Woolly Mammoth 
um, her natural sock. This is actually very similar to Biche Bouche. I would knit those together. That's totally fine. Um, yeah. What else do I have in front of me? I have actually, this is Mondine. Retrosari Mondine. I would knit it without hesitation together with Finnelgarn. No problem. Any, I mean, honestly, with any of these, but that's another one. Mondim, very similar. Um, now we're getting a little bit, well, a little bit, a little bit different. Now we're, we're edging out a little bit different. This is Hampshire Two Ply by the Gray Sheep, the Gray Sheep Company. It has a little bit of alpaca in it. Um, it's again a similar, what does it say? Well, 82 meters to 40, no, 82 meters to 20 grams. So it's a little bit thicker. It's a little bit thicker than the others. Um, that's the same with fennel garn that I've been throwing around and not talking about, but fennel garn is a little bit thicker than the others. So these two actually are very similar um, in knitting. Actually, oops, I would knit those with Mondine. That would be fine. And then the one that's a little bit of a different texture is Wensleydale Long Wool, Long Wool Four Ply. Um, because it's a different sheep breed, it's a shine, kind of a shinier, smoother, denser yarn. It's actually a very similar yardage woo, to Gamelsary. So if you don't mind the sort of woolen, more woolly texture to the sort of more shiny texture, those would knit to a similar gauge um, with no problem. I think that's all the, sample, the examples I have on the ground here. I'm sorry for throwing them all around. Um, but my, my point is, is that you could actually knit any of, oh, I did have one more. Ha, huh. Exmoor sock. It's a sock yarn, um, John Arbin. It is 200 meters to 50 grams. Ah, it's the same as Tuku wool. Tuku wool is woolly and woolen spun. Um, Exmoor is a worsted spun, so it's a little bit thinner, a little bit denser, um, but those, I would have no, I would have no qualms knitting those things together. The other thing just to point out is if you're knitting color work and you're knitting with a lot of different colors or you're changing your pattern a lot, um, you're going to be able to, to fudge it a little bit. And I don't mean like a lot, a lot, like I wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily knit like a worsted with a fingering, but if you've got, you know, something that's a heavy fingering at it up to a sport and then otherwise you've got some J and S and you just need one more color and you have this and you have fennel garn in, in your stash and you just need a couple of rows of it. It's really not going to affect anything. Um, your overall garment, especially if it's, you know, a, a stripe of color work or if it's a part of a hat, it's not going to be so much of a difference as to make a difference in the um, size of your garment, you know, hat, mitt, sweater, whatever it is. The differences in any of these yarns is not going to be enough. Like, look at that together. That looks good. Sort of an off red and an off green. Mm -hmm. See, there's a lot of options here that I think people don't look at because they don't want to mix yarns together. But honestly, any of these yarns, you could knit together in color work and it would come out really nice. Um, knitting in color work, the only thing that I would caution really against is knitting the primary motif in your color work, like say it's like this uh, Selbu Rose, like the Norwegian star pattern or something that's really prominent and graphic, you don't want that color to be a lot thinner than your main color. Um, so if your main your main yarn for the sweater is fennel garn, maybe you're not, you don't want to use Biche Bouche um, or even even more important or even more Wensleydale Long Wool, maybe you don't want that to be that, that motif because it could recede a little bit just being a little bit thinner. So if you wanted to err on the side of being a little bit thicker to make sure that your color work is popping out instead of receding back, that'd be the only other thought that I have in something that's a really graphic, you know, star pattern or um, an anchor or a, a, big, a big thing, a big element that's all in one color. So anyway, I feel like I have thrown yarn around enough to make my point. And my point is that if you have your scraps and you have your scale, you can figure out how many yards that you have, and then you can find a pattern of a few colors or many colors, and you can mix all of these bits together. Oh, that's nice, actually. You can mix all of your bits together and make something really beautiful um, and not be too scared of it throwing off your color work too much. 
So anyway, that's all I had to say. If you have any questions about that, you can always um, write a comment down below or you can send an email to us at info at the woolly thistle.com. And you can, I mean, you can always email us at info at the woolly thistle.com and we will do your best to answer your questions about yarns, about what yarns you can knit together, what yarns maybe you shouldn't knit together for some reason, or suggestions for color work or suggestions for patterns for little tiny bits of yarns for color work. We're always there. Happy knitting. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, I'm looking forward to watching your segment um, after the fact this week. <laughs> Sometimes we just don't get, we, we get, like like I was saying, today's just gone off the rails, but yeah. that's okay. You know, I'm hanging on to this for dear life. So, <laughs> we're here. We're here. So um, what else is going on right now as viewers are watching us? So as viewers are watching us, we are all longing together to be at Shetland Wool Week. Yes, always. I'm pretty sure so that that low. is what's going on. It's yes. not just me. Yes. Um, um, Wouldn't it be lovely? Yes. One day. One, one day. year. Mm -hmm. Not this year. Yeah. But if you're year. there and watching this, keep it to yourself. No. <laughs> no. No, no. Know. Take photos and share them on yes. Instagram and be yes. sure to tag yes. me so yes. that I can see them. I, won't I be will be watching. <laughs> um, and uh, if you, like me, can't be there this year um, or you just want or you are there, um, there is a copy of Shetland Wool Week, the annual. Um, this is the ninth annual. Yeah, it's been um, so far. And uh, it launches tomorrow, the 23rd. So we will, be as you can see, search. they've arrived um, and we will be shipping it out to you very, very soon. Yeah. Yes, I think this is the most organized we have been able to be ever in all the history of us um, doing this. And thank you very yeah. much to Shetland Amenity for helping us mm -hmm. get these nice and early so that while we're um, doing the pre-orders, we have them and we will be sending them out just as soon as they go live, which is great. You're not having to wait extra time right. for us to get them in. They're here. Yep. So, yes. So beautiful book, isn't it? It is a beautiful patterns. book. And this, kits. The cover pattern is the Hattie Yoke, which is designed by Ella Gordon. So Ella um, is, is a signature Ellen, I think. Ella, yeah. sorry, signature Ella. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's beautiful. We are working on kits for this. Yeah. Um, so stay tuned. Be yes. on our newsletter list. Um, and I think we're also going to put together kits for this adorable baby blanket. Ooh. Isn't that so good? Yeah. I was looking at it and I'm like, maybe I want to knit a baby blanket. <laughs> One day. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Um, so, yes, you can find these um, still available for pre-order today and they will start shipping um, as soon as they launch on the 23rd. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. So what else do we have going on with Shetland? Because it is Shetland Wool Week. We are here, not there. But we are celebrating all things Shetland and yes. Wooly. Yeah, there's lots of um, good Shetland to be found in the shop. There's all kinds of hap kits. We've got cones. The um, We did receive, recently receive a top up of our JNS. So many yes. of our kits, if not all of our kits, are back in stock. Yes. Um, Sorry that that happened too. Like, you know, we typically don't get very low on Jameson and Smith. But it happened. It happened. But we're back up and running, which yeah. is fantastic. And, and when it does happen, it usually doesn't happen for very long. So on the website, you can sign up for a back in stock notification. Yeah. And we try to make it so you don't wait very long. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll get an email when the item you're waiting for is ready. Do you know what I'm excited for, too, is um, The Grand Shetland Adventure by Gudrun and MJ. That book is going to be yes. amazing. Yes. You can see all the previews. We have a bunch of photos on the website. Um, yeah. There are previews on Ravelry if you want to see what yarns and stuff are used and that's on pre-order right now thank you for your orders so you two are excited which yes. is great mm -hmm. yeah um and we are working on kits for that one as well yes it takes a lot of time to put all the kits it does together. but it's worth it, <laughs> it it's is. worth it because then you guys don't need to think too hard about it yeah um shall we talk about armscope manor i think we should talk about armscope manor so armscope manor as you know is a very special yarn especially that white one in the middle this is portland wool um, Portland is one of the oldest sheep breeds in the UK and it's actually mentioned in the Doomsday book and um, one of the wonderful things that we have in this episode is that we have an interview with Deborah who is Armscott Manor and I hope you enjoy that chat with her. They also have a small flock of Black Welsh Mountain on their property which is beautiful by the way. Their property and the wool. I love this stuff so much. Yeah. And you knitted your... Yeah, so I knitted my and my half Hansel hat. 
um, out of the with... Black Welsh Mountain, along with some woolly mammoth there in the contrast colors. Mm. But um, it's so good. It's, it's it so really lovely. is. And of and course, it, it is a four ply um, yarn. Yes, all of and these. For my half half, I think I used two skeins. And this year's dash is just such a great gray. I really love this. It's um, a little bit darker, but it's a beautiful, beautiful gray. Yeah. <clears throat> and so that's a blend of the Portland and the Black Welsh Mountain. So these will be going in the shop when, Maggie? Today at noon. Oh, today at noon. How exciting. Um, I do think that um, important to note that, so as you said, this, this year's. So every year they have a single clip of all their wool. And we were fortunate enough to um, oh. get get all of the. It's so beautiful. Yes. Um. So there might be like this is this year's dash. It looks slightly different from last year's because every year they you know it's a different a mixing of different proportions with the Black Walsh Mountain and the yeah. Portland and. Um, so there is some variation. So there just to consider that when you're purchasing that you want to, if you have a project in mind. Yes, that this gray will not match uh, the splash or the dash from before, which which is fine. Um, right. It's like a third It'll gray. still work really well with yeah. those yarns, but if you want it to be that I think color. even looking at the, the Black Welsh Mountain against yours, it looks different this year. And I think that's just, yeah. um, that's part of being close to the ground. You know, the sheep are eating different things. The weather's different. And yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and that's it's, why it's, it's just, so wonderful. It's funny because it, in the knitting, it it's so floofy. Yeah, it is beautiful. Lovely. So those are going live today. Mm -hmm, today, exciting. Noon. And now it's time to go visit Emma. Do you know what she's talking about today? I don't. It's a surprise. So <laughs> let's see you after that. Hi everyone. I'm Emma, and I'm coming to you from Baltimore, as I do about once a month. Um, every other shopcast. <laughs> um, and I'm so happy to be here today with you. It is not really cold enough to be wearing the Cetacel jacket that I finally finished, but I'm wearing it anyway because I am obsessed with it and that the air conditioning's on in my house, so it's okay. But it is cooling off. I mean, like, I live in the mid-Atlantic and this morning it was like in the, in the low 60s, so fall is coming, sweater weather is coming, winter is coming. I can't wait to wear my sweaters, um, much like many of you i'm sure i just can't wait to get them out and wear them all the time They're, it's so sad in the summer when they have to like live in giant plastic bags under the bed and not be worn um i always just feel sad for them but anyway we're almost there i still have not sewn buttons on this jacket um but i did finish it and if you've been following the saga it's been a saga um this is a drop sleeve set of stall jacket kofta that i designed myself from a book called traditional scandinavian knitting um, it will have buttons. There's button holes. I can feel them in here. I did make them. <laughs> um, and I know where the buttons are, which is not always the case. Sometimes I just like have a bag of buttons and then I can't find it for like a year because sometimes life is just like that. But I know where the buttons are. They're in my notions bag. They're ready to be sewn on. When I'm ready to sew them on, sometimes there's like, you know, the emotional labor of sewing on buttons is just too much for like a Saturday morning when I'm just trying to relax. Um, but anyway, here I am. I finished this. And today I'm going to show you my progress on my, on my Woolly Thistle sweater, cow sweater. So I have my bag, the Woolly Thistle bag that says, if you go out, take your knitting, which I always do. And I'm sure all of you do too. Um, so if uh, you watched last time, you will know that I am knitting the super simple summer sweater. <laughs> Say that five times fast. That's probably what I said last time. <laughs> and Wool Dreamers sauna. And it looks too small because it's um, bunched up on cords with stitch stoppers here. Um, and I have modified the gauge to knit it at a slightly, um, slightly smaller gauge. This is about 20 stitches over four inches in a fingering weight yarn instead of the cotton yarn, or excuse me, worsted weight yarn that it's designed for. It's designed for Retrosaria uh, Mungo, which is a wool cotton blend. This is also a wool cotton blend. It's the same content. So 50% wool, 50% cotton. Um, and it's just a lighter weight, so it'll be a little bit, um, it'll be a little lighter weight, a little drapier or less drapey, depending on, yeah, I guess the other one would, would drape more because it'd be heavier. This will be like lighter weight. The drape will be different. Let's say the drape will be different. And it's got these big wide stripes. And this sauna goes a long way. I've knitted all of this. I mean, granted, I'm knitting a pretty small size, but um, all of the white stripes, the two white stripes, and I still have like enough for like probably almost another whole white stripe. And um, and the, the purple here, um, same. Yeah, this is. I'm on the third purple stripe, and I still have I still have some. 
So, and I have three of each of these, so I don't anticipate running out by any means. Um, they're, they're, there's a nice amount of yardage. They're 50 gram balls, but you get about 250 yards on the ball, which is a lot. Um, and it's not super thin, it's just lightweight because it's got wool and cotton in it and it's, it's, there's a lot of air in it. Um, so it's not dense, it's really comfortable, it's quite soft. I'm really excited to wear it. I blocked my swatch and it was just so soft. Um, so I brought my barber cords so that I could actually show you how those work. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have barber cords or TKB cords, sometimes we call them that. Um, but I decided that I was going to try this on for you. And this is getting warm anyway, so this is knitted, if you're wondering. The jacket is knitted in Jameson and Smith two-ply jumper weight in color 81, which is the charcoal, and the, uh, the light gray is Rama Lamelgarn in color 12, um, which has been my favorite new color this summer. So it's just like it's an off-white, but it's a, it's kind of a cool neutral. It's not a warm brown, so I really like that. I like the that the 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 dark color is not a uh, true black. It's like a heathered charcoal, so it just gives the whole thing a little bit more of a sheen almost. I don't know, I love it. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a close up of the yoke before I put it down. Yeah, so I'm quite proud of this. I've been working on it since March. Finally finished it last month. I'm really excited. Okay, so barber cords. Quick overview. We've probably talked about this before on the Shopcast, but in case you, you missed it, they are these hollow silicone cords that come in a variety of colors. I love the red. Always, you can always see them if they're there. I keep them in the tin, but you know, it's always easy to see. So there's a long one for the body, which is 60 inches. And then there are two 30 inch ones for your sleeves. I have a lot of barber cords um, just because I always need to be able to find one at any given time, but you can get them at the Wooly Thistle in a variety of colors. So here's what I'm going to do. I was just taking off my stitch stopper and just like throwing it into the, into the great beyond clearly. So I'm going to take one, one, end of the cord, this is hollow, and I'm gonna put it on top of the needle so that it, it's, it's here, let me show you up close. So it goes, sits right on the needle and you kinda of wanna push it down cause it's gonna suction on there. And you wanna be able to give it a little tug and have it not come off. If you give it a big tug, it'll come off. That's, otherwise you would never be able to get it off. But we're gonna attach both of the ends to the ends of the needles. There we go. Okay, so got a couple options here. People tend to be, oh, you can see my sleeves are on barber cords too, but they're gray. <laughs> People tend to be like, uh, a slide it all onto the cord and get rid of the needle completely and then tie off the cords to make sure you don't lose any stitches type of person. Or they type, tend to be just like a, all right, well, I'm just gonna kind of do this and keep the sweater attached and I'll just try it on, you know, like that. So I am usually the kind of person that slips all of the stitches onto the cord, but that takes longer. So we'll see, maybe we'll just, Maybe we'll just do this thing today. Well, sometimes it's hard to tell what something will look like. You know what, I'm just gonna do this. Um, put the whole thing on the on the cord. So it just kind of slides. Um, you don't wanna do this too aggressively because otherwise the, um, the cord will pop off the needle. But people have a variety of techniques for this. I like to kind of smooth it down onto the cord. Okay, there's one. And now we're doing the second one. All right. So they can get bunched up and then the bunching, and then if you shove the bunched up stitches, that's what causes the um, them to come off of the needles. So I'm gonna keep the needles attached just because it's not, it's no use throwing them and losing them maybe. And you know, so now I can try this on because my sleeve stitches are also on barber cords. Um, I could put this on waist yarn, the sleeves, but I've got barber cords, so I might as well use them. So, there we go. Yeah, fits. Okay, okay. Yeah, it fits exactly the way I wanted it to fit. Look at that. I haven't tried it on yet. This is this is live. You're getting my real reaction. Oh, I love it. I love it so much. I'm gonna wear this to Rhinebeck if it's like kind of warm, um, just because this is really lightweight. So this is my like warm. Uh, Warm, warm weather Rhinebeck option. I will probably be wearing this at Woolen Folk if you see me, um, but, or or maybe on Saturday at Rhinebeck. Um, but if it's too warm, I'll be wearing this because cod willing, it'll be done. <laughs> um, I think this is like two weeks of progress. Last year I knitted it, my sweater super fast in like a couple of weeks, um, but this year I'm going a little slower 
trying to take my time. I've got a lot of other projects on the needles. So this is just my like vanilla knitting for if I go to the movies or like trivia night with my friends or like I'm in the car and someone else is driving. I got my vanilla knitting and it's chugging along. I love it. So it's really comfortable. Um, so yeah, I'll show you how to get it back onto the needles. Um, oh, I just sat on something. No, okay, it didn't pop off. <laughs> I sat on the needle, but it didn't, it didn't pop off the cord. Okay, so now, um, basically I need to find the, where the yarn tail is because I need the, that to be at the end of the needle. So there's the tail. So that's gonna be where I grab it in the middle here, kind of like I'm doing magic loop. It's like a giant magic loop. Woo, the most magic of, magical of loops is knitting barber cords. So it's magic that you can just try it on. It's kind of amazing. All right. <laughs> so this is a little bit fussy sometimes. Hopefully we don't lose any stitches because our cords don't pop off the needles, which happens to me a lot. Um, the the more experienced you get at knitting, the like less freaked out you'll probably be when stitches like live stitches fall off your needles and and you not were not anticipating that to happen, which most people never are. Um, but the stickier the yarn, the less likely they are to ladder, so you probably won't have any like laddering drop stitches that you have to fix. Um, yeah, you'll notice um, if you shop at the Woolly Thistle, that's the kind of yarn that it's gonna stay put, which is awesome. Let me tell you, this is like one of the biggest perks of knitting with Wooly Wool is it just always stays put. So, love that. Huge, huge advocate for Wooly Wool for every reason you could possibly think of, but that's, that's a good one. Is that when you make a little mistake, usually, the wool just stays where it is. It doesn't want to move. Superwash yarn wants to ladder because it doesn't have those scales because the scales have been removed. So we tug it off, give it a big tug and it'll come right off. And you can keep them in this handy tin. Anyway, super washable, the scales have been removed. So um, so sometimes it's just really smooth and slippery. And so the stitches wanna unravel vertically, not horizontally. That's why steaks work. Like I didn't secure any steaks on this, except the front steak of the cardigan. Um, and none of them unraveled. I just sewed them down with a little, just seamed them down into the insides and they don't, they don't budge. So progress. Next time you see me, maybe it will be done. That'll be four weeks. Yeah, it might be done four weeks. That's, that's not too ambitious. <laughs> but this is a great pattern. It's by Hohi Locatelli, which I did not say, but I should say now. She's a great designer. She's such an interesting, she has really interesting stuff. All of her things are so funky and wearable. So I'm excited to wear this. So if you see me at Rhinebeck wearing this, Come say hi. I'll be with the whole Wooly Thistle team. Um, but yeah, that's that's been my knitting lately. I've been knitting a lots of other things, but that's kind of the <laughs> have to you know keep it to keep this nice and short. Can't show you every single thing I'm knitting. Um, that would take like hours. <laughs> but yeah, I've got some spinning to show you too. So I have been spinning uh, a lot of different things, and so I'm gonna do just a quick chat about this. Um, I, so I spent a variety, again, a variety of different types of yarn, and it's been really interesting to see like the difference in the preparation of these yarns. So this, for instance, is a recent uh, Merino spin that I did out of like a club yarn, you know, fiber that gets sent to me. I think it's Hello Yarn. And this is Merino that's been like very processed um, at a place that, that processes a lot of stuff. It's very soft. Um, it took dye really well. Um, and it was fun to spin. I spun this on my, my shacked matchless. I spin a lot of things on my electric spinner, but I actually spun this on my wheel. Recently got it out and started spinning on it again. And I really like it. Um, it was really, but it was, it was very smooth. It was a really smooth experience. I could kind of find that I could draft it to however thick that I wanted to draft it. I had a lot of control. There were not a lot of like little blips in it. No problems. So this is really fun. Um, yeah. I, I do recommend for spinners, like Fiber of the Month Club is so fun because you get like a, a, a dyer will dye something real fun for you. Um, and like colors you'd never put together yourself, even if you know how to dye wool and fiber and yarn. Um, I find that, which I do, I just find that Fiber of the Month Club is just fun. It's a fun surprise. Um, okay, so then this one is the next, a little bit less processed. This is a John Arben Merino spin. This is also Merino, um, but this is from John Arben Textiles. 
um, which you can buy the yarn of them at the Wooly Thistle. You can get uh, Yarnadelic, which is Corydale. I love to spin Yarnadelic, but I also love to knit with the with the mill spun Yarnadelic. Um, you can get Exmoor Sock at the Wooly Thistle, which is great. I've never spun the Exmoor Sock blend, but because there's nylon in it and, and a whole bunch of things, but I'd love to try. Um, but I've knitted socks in it and it's wonderful. And then you can get Devonia also. Um, and I've both knitted and spun Devonia. Beautiful fiber. Um, really like lustrous, like long wools in there. The colors are just amazing. So this is just a merino, um, I think it's called viola merino. I don't even think they make this in yarn anymore. You can just get the top. But um, this is a three ply. And I spun this on my electric spinner. And this, John Arben does combed top. So it's really different fiber prep. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's mill processed, which this is as well, but this is more, um, you know, it's, it's done on like, you just kind of know where it came from a little bit more. Um, this merino came from the Falkland Islands, um, so I know that. But also, you can kind of take a virtual tour of John Arbin's, the John Arbin Mill, um, and you can see all the machines that that uh, kind of take fiber to yarn. And I find that kind of nice. And comb top is just everything is really smooth. It's a worsted prep, so it'll all the fibers are aligned in the same direction. Um, and it's really beautiful. It's You can kind of feel a little bit like it's more, it's not quite as soft um, as a as a super high processed merino, but the spin is really nice. I could drop this really thin, which I enjoyed. I don't want to spin this into a skin because it's still a tiny bit wet, but, um, and then the piece de resistance here is, this is a, a fleece that I, I got at the Maryland Sheep and Wool with a friend of mine who she processed it and she combed it and I dyed it and I spun it. And this is from a Rommeldale CVM uh, crossed with a Romney. So it's like mostly, it's a, it's a cross bread sheep, but it's um, it's got a very bouncy, lustrous fiber. And I did dye this, but there was lanolin still in it and it was so squishy and it puffed up like crazy after I washed it. And it is so bouncy. Like you can see that spring. Oh, yeah, I love this. So the sheep's name is Archie, if, if you wanted to know. Um, if you watch my channel, Tiny Desk Knitting, I talk about Archie sometimes there. My friend Molly and I have already reserved Archie's fleece for next year because we both have been enjoying spinning it so much. And I, one of my things that I want to get at Rhinebeck this year um, is uh, Viking wool combs or just any kind of wool combs because I would like to try processing my own fleece next year, not this winter. I don't want to get a fleece set near sheep and wool because winter is not the time to be processing fleece. Um, I don't, you know, I'd probably rather wash and scour and things with, you know, access to the outside. Um, so next year, next spring, I'm going to get a fleece. I will, I'll probably have half of Archie, this fleece. <laughs> and I am going to process Archie myself and wash the, the fiber in and comb it myself and then dye it and spin it. Because I really love to do a sheep to sweater, not shawl, because I don't wear a lot of shawls, but it's a sheep to sweater project. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my updates for the for the month um, for the sweater cow. I can feel the lanolin from this on my hands. Oh, it's still in there. Um, there are some secrets. You can process uh, wool with soapwort, um, which is a medieval plant, that, uh, like wool processing technique that they used many for thousands of years probably. Um, and that keeps the lanolin in, but it still gets the wool really clean. So that's what my friend Molly did when she processed this, um, the Archie's fleece. So all that's yeah, super fun. I'm really excited. Um, I hope that everyone is enjoying the Flowers of Fort Rose course um, or just knitting along um, the Fort Rose hats and mittens. Here are the mittens in case you wanted to see them. Ah. These, if you're watching next, when this comes out, these are will be either at the Woolly Thistle or on their way there because um, I've made this sample for the Woolly Thistle, of course, but I love them. They're so fun. So you can knit your own version of these. Yay! I'm so, these are just so lovely. They're so cute and I love that they match the hat, which I don't have with me because my hair is up. But get your flowers of Fort Rose. Yay! Um, and tune in again next month. And I hope to see so many of you at Rhinebeck in like five weeks. Um, so this has been great. Uh, I'll see you next month. Bye everyone. Maggie, what is that beautiful basket of yarn you're holding there? This is one of the new kits that's available in the shop. Um, it's called Moa. It's by Lincoln Newman and Moa Hunsed. Um, and it is just a gorgeous overall color work knit with Shirkagarn. 
um, we're hoping to put together multiple colorways. Um, yeah. But at the minimum, this there's is beautiful. This one. Um, yeah, we saw this sweater um, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, it's an all over color work. Mm -hmm. It would strick a garn, mm -hmm. should knit up pretty fast. So, this is a DK white. Mm -hmm. So, just like your um, Mota, yeah. this would knit up very quickly as well. So, yeah. yeah, so this is a brand new kit in the shop. Is it in there now? Yes. Okay, so check that right yeah, out. That it's a beautiful on pullover. Tuesday. Yeah, it's a lovely pullover. Really nice colors. Mm -hmm. Very fall inspired, too. Yes. What else do we want to do? Do we want to announce a winner, Maggie? Yes, we do. Winner number two. A winner number two from last time is at Lynn Timmer 1620. Um, Lynn says, I loved your interview with Julie. Her description of the whole process really clarifies the art and science and serendipity involved. It was helpful to see the actual wool. Thank you. Hats off to Rachel as always with the brilliant footage and gentle descriptions. I'm enjoying the cow too. Great. So Lynn, you are a winner. Please email us at info at the woolly thistle. Put prize winner in all caps in the subject line and we will get you your $25 gift card. Yes. And, and if you're not sure what she's talking about, last our last episode featured an interview with Julie of Black Isle Yarns. Yes. We were fortunate to have some of her kill and sock yarn. Yes. Which came and went in a flash. Thank you. And, we had, and she had worked hard to give us as much as she could. Yeah. So, yes, was that just the last episode? That Time was just flying. the last episode. I, I know. loved talking to Julie. She's lovely. And I'm glad you enjoyed it and that you, that you showed up for her yarn, which is wonderful. Yeah. Check out her own website, blackisleyarns.co.uk, because she has her own website. And you can definitely shop with her directly if that's something you want to do. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we will have more um, maybe in a few months, yeah. give or time to... It's a process. It's it a process, a especially that natural dyeing for sure. Mm -hmm. Hand dyeing naturally. Yes. So well done. If you want to be in the running to win a gift card next time, just leave us a message down below. Subscribe to our channel. Give us a thumbs up and we will pick a winner or winners at random. Yeah. Um, the other things that are available now in the shop of note are line 18. Um, it launched on Friday as of mm, this Monday recording it. It's not yet here, but it is on its way. We've been tracking it. Yes, I think it's refreshing just refreshing the tracking. A little bit behind <laughs> yeah. in this journey. Um, but as soon as it gets here, you know that we will turn it around and get it out as soon as possible. Yeah. Our team is very, uh, they're ready to go. They're adept at getting stuff out fast. Yeah. So. Um, also from Lina, in addition to the Grand Shetland Adventure, yes. is Embroidery on Your Knits. This book has been selling like hotcakes. We can't keep it. And it's still on pre-order. <laughs> and it's still on pre-order. It launches yeah. on the 29th, so you still have time to add it so to exciting. your order as well. So lots of embroidery. Maybe I'll wait for that book to come out and see what I should yeah. add to my the, It looks like a fantastic yeah. book. Yeah, um, really so. beautiful. Embroidering with wool. Oh, I know. Yes, it does. It looks very great. exciting. Um, and also newly here, newly arrived, um, is more issue five, which is just lovely. And this launches on the twenty sixth. This is lovely. It is. It's just really gorgeous. So more it focuses on crochet, um, with woolly wool. And garments. You know, not mm -hmm. not just your granny square blanket, but. Not that there's anything wrong with a green I'm not square saying blanket. there is. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> but you we know, love a good green square. I do, I do. But look at that. Oh my gosh, look at that. Look at that texture, all those loops. Yeah, I, I love what they're doing. They're oh, really- Oh, that's cute, it's a vest. Yes. <laughs> that's really cute. I wanna hug her. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely, lovely shawl. So these guys are getting really yeah. clever with their design. Yeah. We have a few back issues available oh. too. <clears throat> Very gorgeous. nice. They always have gorgeous patterns in there. And of course, in there. Alison is coming <clears throat> from, um, from Edinburgh. This is all produced in Scotland, which I love, of course. Alison is American, uh, living in Edinburgh. Oh, that's so pretty. Gosh, that is so lovely. Makes you want to pick up that hook. We do have some hooks as it happens. We do, we do. Yeah. You can find hooks. And yeah. we have a number of crochet publications. So if you, if crochet is your jam. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, for sure. You know, if you're into crochet, hopefully you find something here that floats your boat a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Love this magazine. And if you're looking for some inspiration for woolly crochet, 
Um, so more. Yes. Um, so also new in the shop, um, one of our delightful designer friends, Mary O'Shea, um, known as Tully Mung Mungan on um, Instagram, has designed a new sock pattern that uses Rambler and Plum. I'll put a picture. Um, yeah. It is called the Fuzzy Peg Socks. I love that name. Fuzzy Peg. Um, and it has a beautiful cable design going up the front, and you use one skein of Rambler, and for most of them, I think you use one skein of mohair. So we have some kits going in the shop. Um, they should be there. Let's I look at some of the now. pairings you've pulled together. Yeah. Here. So, so I think with this, you could use any, um, yeah. I mean, if Rama you wanted Plum. marl, I think, oh, it's on my desk. <laughs> oh, here it is. Yeah. Here I couldn't fit it all in the basket. So we do have a lovely pairing mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. This is assuming that now you could certainly grab one skein of Rambler and if you wanted like a contrasting color. Um, tomorrow, um, yeah. that would be really cute too. Um, so we've paired Lake and Rama Plum 114. Mm. Oh, I know, so good. Look at this, it's so pretty. I know. Beautiful. Winter sky. Ooh, so Rama Plum is the mohair. Look at these, I mean, it's like they're meant to go together or something. It's just gorgeous. Yeah. Our Trillium and color 174. Yeah. So, love these. And another green. Gorgeous. And so, those are just some of the pairings. I don't think I grabbed. I must be missing some mohair. Okay, no worries. No. So, yes, so Rambler socks. It's great. Yes, yeah, so these will knit up quickly. Perfect for gift knitting if you're thinking about yes. as we enter gift season. And even though the Rambler is a high twist, you know, designed for socks, it's 100% wool. So adding this can only add a bit of strength as well as comfort yeah. and softness too. Yeah. Lovely I juggling. Think it just makes it feel a little bit extra too. A little bit extra. A little bit extra. Why not, right? <laughs> yeah. So. I love there you go. So these are these are available and they should be available in the shop now. Um, and just double check. If not, get on our newsletter list and we'll let, let you know when it releases. Yes, yes. So I think that's it for what we wanted to talk about this time. Yeah, Maybe. I mean, there's so much. Always so much. There's always so much. About. I think we should go to our interview with uh, Deborah, who is Armscott Manor, and enjoy that. And then after that's done, we'll go straight to some yoga with Kim. I'm not sure what she's doing. Do you know what she's doing this time? I thought it was something to do with your back, but. Oh, uh, that's always good. So have a wonderful couple of weeks. And um, I think all that's left to say now is if you go out. Take your knitting. Bye. So hello, everybody. Um, I am thrilled to have Deborah Williams of Armscott Manor with us today. I think this interview with you, Deborah, is long overdue. And I'm really excited to finally be chatting with you. And I think we'll have lots and lots to talk about. So welcome to the Woolly Thistle, and thanks for being here. Oh, thanks, so, Lauren. I mean, we've communicated via email for so long. I know. I know you, actually, and especially <laughs> you, you you are from very near, well, you live near Armscott Manor for a while, which is very interesting. When we first moved in 30 years ago, you were up the road in Leamington Spa. What, what that is true. Is that? You know? I know. I know. So maybe we start there and talk about where Armscott Manor is actually located because it's in a beautiful part of England in the Midlands. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about where it's located. Well, when I tell many of my friends in the States, I would say if you see a picture on a map of Great Britain, stick a pin in the middle of <laughs> England. And that's kind of where we are. Uh, right. But it's really, it's really quite interesting because we're between Stratford and Avon, which many of your followers yes, may have heard about imagine. Shakespeare but I think um, another little known fact is it used to be the second capital of England huh. because of the importance of wool it was the center of the wool trade and so wool was produced there and then sent down the river Avon and from there to Bristol and it went to the rest of the world. I mean, to the Vikings, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Um, and that is why there are so many big houses, old houses in that area. And also why when there was the British Civil War, we had one too, not just you guys over in the <laughs> States. <laughs> um, it was actually started in that part of the world and um, everyone may have heard of Guy Fawkes, Guido Fawkes, mm -hmm. who was part of the gunpowder plot trying to blow up the Houses of Parliament. Yeah. Well, during the history of our house, 
he allegedly stayed and hid in our house. Really? So that, that's something we, we know about. But um, fascinating. Yeah. So going back to the house, it's um, Jacobean. So it's on, it was built under uh, the Stuarts, under James I, which you will know about, yeah. being a yes. for yourself. Right. So um, it was built by a gentleman called John Halford, who is a wool merchant and also a religious nonconformist. He was actually um, a member of the Quakers. Ah, oh, lovely. And the house has quite a connection with the Quakers. So John Halford Sr. started building the house at the end of the 1600s, 1500s, sorry, 1500s, big, big yeah. Take my parsnips. <laughs> and then his uh, son, John Halford, who finished the house, finished it in the very early 1600s. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very simplistic Jacobean house. It hasn't got all the very fancy decorative plaster work, et cetera, as many other houses. But for any of your, um, your listeners and followers who actually are interested in British architecture, we have... Um, little lead diamond windows, so lead around pieces of glass, float glass. But the windows are surrounded by stone mullions. Hmm. Uh, Jacobean houses have stone mullions. Tudor houses earlier had wooden mullions. And that's one of the ways you can tell just yeah. by looking at a house, whether it's Tudor or Jacobean. So. Well, I feel I feel the need to rush <laughs> over there and start examining all these beautiful houses. Yeah. Um, well, well We'll put a picture of the manor so that everyone oh, understands yeah, what we're talking about. Absolutely, so they can understand that. And the other thing is, because John Halford was a lord of the manor, on the top of the house are finials at yeah. the top of the apex of the building, little finials, and we have a ball on the top. Uh -huh. You could only have stone balls if you were a squire or a lord of the manor. <laughs> That's a known fact. <laughs> that is um, wonderful. I love that. That is great history. And so how long have you lived there? Uh, we've lived there for just over 30 years. We moved in when my youngest was 18 months old in 1991, July 1991, and it's been our family home ever since. And um, we've been very keen to, to do all the things we love there. And one of the things I was very keen on is because it was built by a wool merchant was to bring back mm. sheep. Mm -hmm. skirt. Yeah, so uh, there were no sheep there when you moved there. You did that. Uh, Funny yeah. enough, the lady who owned the house before us, a very, very interesting lady called Amanda Docker, um, was one of the first ladies to design with dried flowers. Oh. So there, for anyone who's looked up the house, there is a book, Armscape Manor, Dry Flowers, and she used to grow dry flowers in the gardens. Oh. So the, the gardens weren't very established, and most of the fields were taken over with growing these flowers. Yeah. So um, when we arrived, I decided I'd like to have sheep and there was a lot of land to graze. We have about 44 acres now. Right. And I went to see a chap called Jim Henson. Now, anyone who watches Country File, I don't know if you get it over there. But I it's think a very we can on YouTube. Yeah. Ah, well yeah. worth watching if you're interested in the British countryside. Yeah. And the chap who sort of runs it is, is called Adam Henson, who farms near to us in the Cotswolds. And his father, Jim, set up the rare breeds farm near to us in Guiting Power. And um, I went to see Jim. I said, I want to have sheep. And I said, what would you suggest I have? And he said, well, Deborah, we, there's a lot of rare breeds in this country. Why not have a breed? And and by having them and farming with them, you can do some good. You'll mm -hmm. be helping a, a rare old breed survive. So I fell in love with Portland sheep. Why, why did you fall in love? Why oh, did you fall in love with them particularly? Um, well, they've got very gentle nature. They're, they're semi-primitive. By that, it means uh, they're not very tame. Mm -hmm. um, they have, to, to answer your question why I fell in love with them, they have golden faces and golden legs. Yeah. The males and the females have horns. Okay. They're very gentle natured. And what's interesting about the horns, they've got black lines on them. Hmm. Um, so it looks like um, someone's drawn them on with a magic marker pen. <laughs> and I remember showing them at um, a, a, our local town is called Shipston on Star, which used to be Sheep's Town, of course. Ah, oh, that makes sense. And it had a, a river there, and a lot of the sheep were taken there to wash them through the river. Right. Uh, when there were a lot of flies and bugs before the fleeces were shorn to clean them. Right. Um, and I showed, we had a very enterprising local gentleman uh bob actually set up the wolf and i was a patron of it we used to show our sheep there and this one little girl said mommy look that lady's drawn on the sheep's horn. <laughs> they're all different patterns but she noticed which yeah. is wonderful yeah 
Um, and that that's intriguing me. But it's their, their natures. They're very yeah. gentle. They yeah. are shy of people. Um, yeah. They are the reason they are very rare is because they're non-commercial. By that I mean they normally only produce one lamb, and of course, as mm. probably everyone knows, most commercial sheep produce twins or triplets. Right, which makes them more economically viable. Yeah. Um, and over the years, and we have been breeding them now for twenty-nine years. Yeah. We have the genetic pools, and we have two. One is called Armscut. One is called Acorn. So each year they're born. Um, we have a different letter of the alphabet. And because I'm very fond of gardening, mm-hmm. and that's something we can talk about later, mm-hmm. um, what we did at Armskirt, um, yeah. we choose the letter of the alphabet. So um, let me see. I can't remember what it is this year. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if it was P, it would be Armskirt Petunia. Okay. Um, so choose a plant name um, and try and choose a male or female flower. That was That's quite an interesting one but they're all registered with the uh rare breed survival trust and interesting enough uh joe henson's children libby henson runs the rare breed survival trust which helps promote all rare breeds not just sheep but Mm -hmm. cows and hens and geese Mm -hmm. and chickens etc except pigs horses and Mm -hmm. she keeps records of the gene line of these rare breeds and adam is is breeding them and they run the rare breed survival trust um Petting farm, yeah, where, which is wonderfully guiding power, but also he's promoting them as an ambassador being on the country farm. That's kind of what we do. So we show in local sh- shows like Morton, Morton, um, Morton and Marsh has the biggest one day agricultural show in the mm-hmm. country. We show our sheep there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really to get out and say what lovely natured sheep they are. Mm. Um, so that's why we got into them. I mean, a, a little bit of the history of the Portland, they are the old known breed of sheep in England. This is the part that I always get shivers <laughs> up and down my spine. I know, oh, yes, I know. tell us more about that. Um, well, the, we, the reason we know this is they are the only breed of sheep to be mentioned in the Doomsday Book in 1066. Yes, 1066. So, and, Amazing. And it is. And they're called Portland sheep because they're from the Isle of Portland, yes. which is a small island of the south of England. If right. you look at us with you know England, yeah. Wales, East Anglia, the two legs at the bottom, right at the very bottom. There's a little isle, island, and it's a salt marsh. Mm-hmm. And um, these sheep are used to surviving with very little. So that's another benefit of rare breeds, which I would just mention. Uh, they they can survive. Two or three can survive on a piece of ground, pretty rough ground that commercial sheep couldn't. Mm-hmm. So that that is a plus for them. And a lot of these rare breeds are immune to diseases that commercial sheep are very prone to, like you may have heard of scrapie mm-hmm. um, and foot rot. Mm-hmm. Um, my sheep and the rare breed sheep, not. Right. So when we had that awful disease, foot and mouth, I don't mm-hmm. know if you get it in I, the States. I think we've, not as bad as you did a few years back, for sure. Yeah. But yes, I'm sure it's known here. Yeah, so our farm was literally closed and my husband couldn't even bring his car in because he worked in London mm-hmm. for, a very, for oh gosh, nearly 18 months to stop mm-hmm. disease being spread to the flock to protect them. Yeah, And you know, it's very important to have biodiversity because when there are these diseases, our sheep are immune to a lot of these diseases and they survive. Right. So I'm, that's I'm, primitive the primitive yeah. of them the primitive yeah because yeah. yeah. as you well know because i can see behind you you've got some of our black welsh mountain sheep yes. as well yes i do yeah and this is one of my favorite uh wolves as well the black welsh mountain and it's just it's soft and it's lovely so you have a small flock of of these two yeah, well, it, it's a bit of a, a story because my my husband, we're Welsh, we're Welsh, and anyone who knows Great Britain, we have a different language. Yeah, um, Shara Cumbrai means do you speak Welsh? And <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. uh, we're very patriotic, especially when it comes to the rugby, as Corin would confirm, which is the Rugby World Cup is on at the moment. Oh wow! And I had and my husband wanted to eat lamb. Now that is our national dish in Wales. I don't eat lamb and I wouldn't let him eat my sheep. I said, no, you can't eat the Portland sheep. That's not possible. <laughs> no, you just can't. So, so he said, well, 
Deborah, I'm surrounded by sheep and I'm not allowed to eat them. And I said, no, no, they're a rare breed. You can't eat them. We're breeding them. They're, they're very good people here. So I got into some black Welsh mountain sheep because there's that story about being the black sheep in the family. Uh, <laughs> so it was my sense of humour. <laughs> so um, in the end, um, my, and my daughter said, Mummy, you're not going to let Daddy eat one of the sheep, really, are you? And I said, well, look, it was a promise. So um, my husband sort of forgot about it. So there were these beautiful little black lambs jumping around in the field. And he said, by the way, where are those black Welsh mountain lambs you said I could eat? And I said, well, they're those big sheep in the corner and they're no longer lamb. So you can't <laughs> eat them. So he felt, he, <laughs> yeah, I think he's felt uh, yeah, a bit ganged up on there. But um, what is good is that I, I, I breed them separately. Obviously I have a different tup for the, the Portland and the black, but it's easier to discern which is which by them being different colors. But yeah. I, I decided, well, I've not been producing all that long. I think it's about eight years now. And all the wool it, that's produced in England is bought by the British Wool Marketing Board. And right. it was all put into a big pot. So you couldn't buy, they didn't differentiate between Portland and everything else. Right. And I think that was such a shame because it is an exceptional wool. Mm -hmm. So I just started looking into producing my all, own wool. And this is so not my background at all. Horticulture is. And, yeah. I, and I here in the States refurbish historic property. So this is really out of my comfort zone. She was out of my comfort zone. <laughs> this is in your <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I got in touch uh, with a natural fiber company, which is a company in Launceston in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. and um, started producing the wool. And it's it's had an extremely good reaction. It was hard with the marketing because, as I said, so not in my comfort zone. But the little symbol that we have on it, I did design the label. It's beautiful. It's These are it's actually, yeah, um, it, it, it's twofold. Firstly, it is um, a summer pavilion we have at the corner of the garden. But it also looks like French beehives so yeah. behind it are my beehives and so we put the bees on as well and we just thought that summed us up a bit exactly, so exactly. Um, Very pretty. and you, when you turned it around you could see it's make, proudly made in Britain yeah. so it is and the reason we put that is not just because it's British rare breed but it is actually processed in Britain right because a lot, it is a lot cheaper to do it in Thailand Elsewhere. yeah or, or wherever um and we felt it would be dishonorable to this very rare british breed that was in the doomsday book not to have it processed in england so yeah. that is what yes we did. and i think quite right too because it's a it's a beautiful beautiful skin of yarn yeah. <laughs> and i know you know we we have sold a lot of it our customers love your yarn and so it's always a treat when that time of year comes around that we can we can have it again. Well, thank and, you. I mean, yeah. it is a single flock. At the moment, I have 142 sheep. Mm. So um, one of the things we do to encourage the survival of the lambs um, is we don't send the tuck in, the male, until November. They have a five-month gestation. So the lambs are born in May, where the weather is hopefully a bit better. But these days, who can tell? I know. And, <laughs> and so it gives them a better chance of survival. Um, I recently did um, a, an interview with a lady called Helen Babs for a magazine, which is about small holdings, like our own small farms. And we and she's got a lovely picture of my little black Welsh mountain lambs wearing red coats, uh, waterproof coats, to, to keep them from getting a chill and dying, because this is what happens. Um, we have to keep them warm and protected. Um, but what we liked, we had the black wool and we had the Portland wool, and then we blended them together. I love to make this one. Dash. Uh, so that's Armscot Manor Portland wool with a dash of black Welsh mountain wool. But what I love is you can see the flecks of the different colour fleeces in there. Yeah. And I think that gives an amazing depth to whatever knitting project exactly and i think this particular shade of gray that you've got this year because it's different than before is my favorite it's beautiful it's it, is it, good, it, isn't it? it has yeah. depth for sure and it's a little bit darker than than i might have expected and i think it's perfect it's good perfect. thank you for that yes i mean and that is one of the things i really like that being undyed mm -hmm. and natural 
um, the colours do vary. It depends on the rain, what's in the grass. We we are not stipulated as organic, but we conservation graze. So we do not add any chemicals to the ground. Right. Um, and when we have to sort of send our nitrogen returns to um, DEFRA, which is the Department of, Edu of Environment um, and Farming in the UK, we have to do this extraordinary calculation, which is what goes into them. The only mineral they have is the hemolin pink salt, their salt mix, um, times the number of sheep to work out the amount of poo is going into the ground. So that's nitrogen. So that's conservation grazing. That's oh. all that goes into the ground other than what's in the rain. Right, right. Um, but you are right that, that the environment changes year on year. Um, yes. Our eating might change based on what's coming up. And that will have an impact on the fleece, which will have an impact on what we end up with for yarn. But I'm very happy to see that your Portland has veg matter milled right into it. That always gets me excited because it means it's very minimally processed and close it to is. the ground that it, it is. came from. Yeah. Yeah. It, so it's, it's... let me just, um, I want to just jump back because you're telling us wonderful things and it's, it's really interesting. Some people might not even know what the Doomsday Book is. So I wanted to mention it's, it's an ancient, it was an ancient sort of survey of England that William the Conqueror um, decreed had to happen. And he sent his soldiers out to take stock basically of who, what, where, how much. And that was the mention that the Portland sheep got was in there saying, I think there was over 900 sheep, 908 or something. Portland. Oh my sheep. gosh, I didn't know that, Corin. Well done, you. <laughs> yes, that's what it is. And so that was the first time that the sheep of any breed of any kind was ever documented. And the Doomsday Book is just a very famous book. And I, I think, I'm not sure where the original is now. It's in some very, you know, worthy place, but I don't remember where it is off the neither, top. Neither do I. But I mean, for those who are not familiar with our history, William the Conqueror was French. Right. So uh, uh, just for people to know that. But we were also invaded in Armscot many, many years ago. Um, which huh. is interesting. By, of course, the Vikings. They never got into Wales, by the way. I would like to I was mention. Say, so we, <laughs> we were, and a, a, a bit of the interesting history is that in Wales, most of the warriors were female. Uh, so, being a Celt uh, myself, I always think that's quite interesting. But yeah. uh, historically, by the time John Halfer was producing wool, the wool was going down the Avon and actually going to Scandinavian countries because they loved our wool. Huh. But Armskirt is a hamlet of, I think it's about 54 houses as of today. And it's very small, but there are two large houses, our house and another one called Armscot House, because right down the middle, we were under Dane law in 800 and something or other, under King Guthrid, and on the other side of village, it was Mercy. So it was the British kings and Christianity, which is fascinating. That is. And we've done some excavation. Um, uh, there was an old barn. Every, every village historically in the United Kingdom, it was sure in the states had a blacksmith because our invader transport was horses so the pub which is now called the fuzzy duck and a jolly good pub it is as well if anyone wants to <laughs> visit it. i want um, to <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. that was the blacksmith's and yeah. he had a barn and that barn um was on a piece of land we bought and unfortunately um the, it became a bit dilapidated and, and the council put a, a demolition order on it. so we had to excavate it we decided to put um a bigger barn there uh, for all our equipment, etc., and put up, put my office and uh, my husband's office in there. And when we excavated, we found a lot of medieval Viking China, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh my gosh! So, which was very, very interesting. And then, literally, in the next village, Newbold on Star, going towards Leamington Spa, they found an Anglo-Saxon stone circle. Which, oh. if anyone is interested to look it up, Newbold on Star and Warwickshire, there are pictures of this extraordinary excavation. And then also in Armscot, we have a very special Quaker meeting house. Um, it, I think it was probably what drew me to the village first when I, we were looking to move and as the family was expanding. I had three children when we moved um, moved to Armscot, Amy, Charles and Henry. Um, and that building is beautiful. And the Quakers were actually having meetings there. And the chapter was run by a gentleman called Anthony Lowley. And a lot of Quakers, as I know, actually took safe passage and went to America. Mm -hmm. um, and when we first moved there, the, it was an active chapter. They would meet one 
Sunday a week, which is called Gooseberry Sunday. Now, I didn't know when Gooseberry Sunday was, but it was actually the second Sunday in August when mm-hmm. people pick gooseberries. Mm-hmm. And they used to have a meeting there, and then they'd come and walk around the grounds because um, George Fox, the founder of the Quaker movement, actually held a meeting at the house, our house, um, Armscott Manor, with John Halford. And at that time, the house was in Worcestershire because it's been in four counties during its time, because it is right in the middle. So it's in Warwickshire at the moment, but it's been Worcestershire, Gloucestershire, and Oxfordshire. At that time, Worcestershire, and a milkmaid who worked in Halford came to the meeting to meet John uh, John Fox, but and sadly told her employer that that was where she was going when she was caught, and he sent for the magistrates to come and arrest George Fox was talking, holding a meeting in our house with John Halford. And his daughter wrote a book that any Quakers who are watching this um, this interview um, would know called Poor You because George Fox was going up to Lincolnshire to meet his mother who was terribly ill. He'd been put in prison many times because Quakerism was against the religion of the day, which is why they were called religious nonconformists. And mm-hmm. John Fox gave him safe haven and she was worried that if her her father was imprisoned again he wouldn't survive it because it was pretty tough in those days life in general let alone being in prison Um, he did luckily um, and he did get to see his mother Um, but that that is you know part of the politics of the day which I found fascinating but what has happened to the meeting house now is um the Ettington chapter that's another village close by decided that they couldn't sustain the building and maintain it, although we did help with maintaining the grounds, et cetera. So the Charity Commission of Great Britain decided it should go up for sale by charity. Um, and although my husband said we can go to the auction and bid for it, it went higher and higher and higher. And I went even over what my husband said I could bid for it, but I still didn't get it. <laughs> so that's another story. Um, uh, and a developer bought it. And and the... Um, Planners said it could either be existing use or commercial use. Nobody wanted to set up a new religion. So right. um, so he they wouldn't let him build on various parts of the grounds because Quakers, um, Quakers bury other Quakers, but they never mark the graves. And actually, once they're buried, they really don't seem to mind what happens to the remains. It could be built on or dug up or whatever. Right. But um, a lot of us were a bit wary of... of what you well, mean? Oh, disturbing yeah. their peace, disturbing their peace. So it it was turned down, and in the end, it couldn't get planning. And my husband and I bought it, and we are currently trying to very carefully restore it and keep it to a lovely shell, so it has some sort of residential use. Because Quakers from all over the world come and visit this meeting house; it's very well known, and um, also relatives of John Halford from all over the world come and want to come yeah. and see that. So we're trying to restore that because I'm very fond of it. And Mr. Lodi is very pleased we're doing that, which is is lovely affirmation. Yeah. But um, so and that's what's happening with the Quakers aspect at the moment. Um I think I don't know if you've got a picture of that. I could I could send I you would one love in. a picture of that in mobile and right. it here. It's a very beautiful house. Yeah. That's fascinating. I love this. So now tell me about um, the actual house itself that you're in. It Does it have any hidey holes or any sort of? Well, it did. It did. It had, to, um, it had what they called a great hall. If you look at the house, there are two apexes. Mm-hmm. And to the right, there's another uh, room, which is actually the dining room. There used to be a great hall here. And it burnt down in at the end, at the beginning of the 1900s and it was rebuilt um, and at the time there are cellars under the house um, at the time they would some of those were uh, filled in because of this demolition of this barn but underneath that is where George Fox was supposed to have hid and we also have in the library a, a Charles II fireback which is uh, a, lead, a, a metal fire back to the fire to stop the stone getting damaged for those who don't know and it's got the royal oak on it and you're only allowed to have one of those fire backs if the king had stayed in your house so we have given we have given uh through the through the centuries because you're only a custodian in these historic houses um and you try and keep them as well as you can before passing them on to the next generations 
Um, so we've had many interesting people who've passed through their walls during the time it's been built. Um, and I believe there were hidey holes in the cellar. But what is interesting about the cellar is that um, it it has the original ale holes. They're shells with oak where ale jugs, because most people drink ale rather than water, were stored, which I found very interesting. And um, I don't know if this is a little bit of a twilight zone moment, but um, they obviously kept pigs down there at, because they're milking still, uh, milk, stone milking stools. So they obviously took animals down there through the back of the house. And there are lots and lots of limes. They must have um, slaughtered pigs or something there because that keeps coming through the stone for years and years. So you can't walk on it. So I built a sort of platform with a roca with glass on it. So all the water can run down it and pump through the, the, the it, because it's below ground, through the, the stone walls and it pumps into the rose garden behind it. But when I was on my hands and knees scrubbing this stone floor, I am pretty convinced there were two women next to me also scrubbing it. I, oh. I felt, I'm serious. I felt it's a very happy house. I'm there a lot of my own. I have a lot of candlelight, a lot of open fires, and I feel as comfortable as comfortable. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a happy house. Yeah. But that time I was not alone doing that chore. That is fascinating. I get shivers. I think we'll all have shivers hearing that. Well, I, I've done a lot of restoration of work of houses, um, in the UK and also in Savannah, Georgia, because I have a connection with that. And hence Mr. and Mrs. Hoffman behind her. He's a 1930s artist. Well, he he was a 1930s artist in Savannah, Georgia. And um, which I think hence the sort of very serious doer expression. And his first wife died of TB and then he married his wife's sister, but they were he was they were artists. Yeah. And um, the you probably all your listeners probably know all about this more than I do, but um, the government had a, a bit like our arts and craft movement in the UK. The government actually assisted artists, and he painted um, the Bull, a beautiful frieze around the Bull Street Library in Savannah, Georgia. And what is fascinating is that it's the figures are almost like Robin Hood. Hmm. Now I don't know if anyone's heard of it, but Robin Hood, it's a, a tale, was allegedly a, an ex nobleman who robbed the rich to feed the poor right. and he wrote uh, he painted this extraordinary frieze if anyone ever visits savannah in georgia go to the bull street library and ask to be let into the room to see this frieze because it's phenomenal yeah. and one of the scad buildings because that's the university i was involved in savannah college of art and design which i think is phenomenal um they have a a building also on bull street uh, and around the stage he drew on um, the most he painted the most beautiful mural so um, I found these paintings um, and, and a third one, which is in the house here, um, in a junk store on 37th Street in Bull. And, and I restored them and did the history. They were sold by his great granddaughter. Amazing. Um, so, yeah, so they are here with me at the moment. But when I die, they will be returned to the Telfer Museum in Savannah. So they're here just for a short stay. <laughs> that's lovely and just what a what a coincidence that you found them as well in a junction yeah, and yeah exactly a that yeah that's really interesting but <laughs> going back to the house um and I mentioned I restore historic properties it was um a bit bit tired when we bought it um mm -hmm. and the gardens as I said uh, had many uh dry flowers growing in them so my big passion is gardening as well as sheep and wool and so we restored the gardens. And at that time, my remit was I wanted to retain the formal structure, but use informal planting. Now, in those days, we didn't have famous designers like Arnie Main and Peter Olifson that do the sort of very naturalized uh, wild planting. But that is what I want. And I met through a lady who ran the WFGA. And I'm very happy to go and explain what that is. Mm, in a minute. Yes. A young gentleman called Dan Pearson, who who is a very famous garden designer now, who helped me. He was an extraordinary artsman from Kew to replant the gardens at Armscourt. And we are still working on them. But the WFJ was the Women's Farm and Garden Association. And during the World Wars, uh, when the men, men were away fighting, the women basically ran all the farms and produced food for our country and our troops. And sadly, a lot of husbands didn't come back 
or if they did came, come back, they were physically or mentally disabled. So with the Royal Society of Horticulture, the WFJA enabled these women to train to be professional gardeners and to earn a living because ladies of that era didn't have careers. Mm. So we have trained ladies through the WFGA. They come to us for two days a week for a year, and we've trained 19 students here, and we've sponsored them at Historic Royal Palaces. So people in London had a chance to train. Now, Historic Royal Palaces are... Kensington Palace, where Princess Diana used to live, and um, Hampton Court Palace, oh, Kew I Palace, um, I've got to get this right, and Tower of London. Have I missed one? No, I think that's right. So, um, and we so train gardeners there. To, we paid for them to be trained there with um, Graham Dillamore, who's head of gardening there, which was very exciting. I loved that when I was reading about it. <clears throat> so basically, this is an organisation that started during the World Wars. Is that the same as the Land Girls? Is that... Well, uh, they they were the people who basically mobilized the land girls, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and and so now today, you still have. Are they always women, or can they be men now? I think they're allowing men now, but I've only ever had women, and we still keep in touch with all our trainees. I mean, some of them have gone into great and good things and had amazing careers, but some of them have come to us because they wanted to change their career. One lady had a heart attack. Another one had brain tumor. One lady. Um, I would say just was very shy mm -hmm. and you could see her blossoming because being in nature, it's a bit like knitting. We would right. talk about this earlier. It's very meditative. It's very contemplative. It's, it, it's a very wonderful thing to add to your life, to have mm -hmm. a slow craft. Mm -hmm. um, and gardening is the same thing. It's very creative, but you're out in nature doing it a bit like me up to my knees in snow with, hay bales in the middle of winter cracking the ice for the water for the sheep <laughs> um but it but I love it I wouldn't do I wouldn't have it yeah. another way yeah, yeah. so oh yeah God. it's all part and parcel it's wonderful talking to you I feel all of us will agree that we could just listen to you wax poetic for a very long time it's, it's oh my gosh you have to shut me off soon I'm sure <laughs> well, we probably do have to watch the time but I I just thank you so much for um sharing your life with us and and the house and the history it's fascinating and also uh about the sheep as well so before we go let's just go back to the sheep a little bit if i may and so the portland portland sheep are sort of semi primitive they're very resilient they're shy they're they've got golden faces and legs so i'm getting a nice picture of them and but they're on the conservation list tell us about the or the rare breed every survivor list they yeah. have various categories the highest high risk medium risk whatever portland are still on high risk hmm. um and and there's another reason for that because it's the meat it's it's slow maturing so it's never eaten as lamb it's eaten right. as hobbit now interesting enough this this ties in with american history it was george the favorite george the third's favorite okay it's also our king charles's favorite huh. and so being hogget so it's after lamb but before mutton right um it is slow maturing so you cook it very slowly like you would a, a casserole or a stew or a, a french door um, it's normally it, it cooks very well with um, capers and it has extraordinarily, as I mentioned, the breed came from Portland, um, which is by the sea, little island in the sea, and they grew up on salt marshes. The meat still has a salt taste, a salty taste. Uh, really? Even though uh, they're growing up at, at your place? In Armskirt, I know. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Uh, but we do... I, I have a, a, a lady shepherdess because we also do um, work experience. We've done a horticulture and an agricultural apprenticeship with the local agricultural college in Morton Morrill. And um, we always have lady shepherds uh, because we, <laughs> I we, love try, we try and continue that. Yeah. Um, but but um, Emma, who's been looking after the flock with me for a very long time, had to make me a little bit more how can I put it um mercenary because I kept them all as pets mm. and then I was running out of land so she has helped me refine the two gene lines mm -hmm. which is very important name for and arms cut as I mentioned and we do send the castrated males the weathers mm -hmm. to market but they go to a specialist meat market in London who mm -hmm. specialize in rare breeds hog it and wow. to appreciate what it is and the fact they have a very happy life with us and they're 
conservation grazed and they're not overbred and we don't always we don't always breed every year for example this year we didn't have lambs we will next uh, we, we, the top is coming november we will produce lambs next year so oh. every we give the flock a break which makes them stronger yeah. and as a result both acorn and armscot lines our portlands produce a large number of twins which has been noted by other breeders and the yeah. portland breeders association which is something to be proud of that's amazing you're, mm-hmm. you're doing amazing work and and it's really lovely to hear about it Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. Really, really enjoyed it. And I know everyone watching will be thoroughly enjoying it too. So thanks again. And I hope we connect again soon. That would be lovely. Bye, Corey. Bye-bye. Hi, welcome to Yoga for Knitters. My name is Kim and I am a yoga teacher and a knitter based here in central Alberta, Canada. I offer online classes, in-person classes, and subscriptions, and you can find more information about all of those things on my website, turninggroundyoga.com. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. Today's class is all about resetting the back. Sometimes when we're sitting and knitting or doing whatever else we need to do during the day, typing or weeding or cleaning or whatever whatever that task is, our back can get a little stiff and sore. It also can get stiff and sore from sleeping. At night our bodies heal and then when we wake up we're a bit stiff and stuck. So this quick sweet practice is all about loosening up the back so that no matter what's going on in your life you're going to feel a lot more limber, agile and uh, happier to move. Let's get started. You can do this practice either on a mat on the floor or on a chair. We're going to do it two times and I'll demonstrate first the floor and then the chair and then you can decide which way is best for you today. So if we're on the floor and your wrists are okay with this, we're going to come to all fours. Pay attention when you're setting up your alignment that your wrists are right under your shoulders and your knees are right under your hips and then that the pads of the fingers are pressing gently into the floor. That way, we're really supporting ourselves on all four corners of our hands. So the two corners along the pads of our hands and the two corners along the heel of our hands. We're also pressing the pads of our fingers into the floor. That way, we have a really good base of support. So here we are in all fours. We're going to inhale, drop the belly, lift the chest and head. This is called cow. And then exhale, pull the belly button in, round the back, look past the knees, this is cat. Close your eyes and inhale and exhale between these two shapes. With your x-ray specs on, you can see what's happening to your spine. You can see the spine flex and extend in one direction and then the other. And we're just knocking off the rest. All the tight spots, all the places where we were holding our muscles, or maybe where connective tissue was getting a little stuck. It's all moving away and making space for clean, easy movement. And then stop and come back to center. Okay. Check with your hands, make sure you've got a good base of support here. And then we're going to start to make circles with our ribs. So we are moving through cat-cow, but we're also moving laterally, side to side. And it feels so good. (laughs) It takes a little bit of thinking about, it's almost like you have something attached to your belly button and you're trying to make a circular shape. Like imagine you have a pencil right here and you're drawing a circle like that. Sort of how we're going. We'll switch directions. The head may or may not follow. Just do what feels natural. None of this should hurt or feel awkward or weird. Your body should just be like, yeah, I didn't realize I needed that, but that feels good. Good. 
Okay, we're going to move laterally now. So same thing, we've got that same setup with our hands under our shoulders and our knees under our hips. We're going to inhale here on all fours and then exhale and uh, reach your nose towards your toes on one side. Feeling the stretch along the side of the body on the other side. Then back four and over the other side. And back four. Good. Just move side to side, exhaling to reach, inhaling back to center. Awesome. Come back to center. Turn the fingers of your left hand in towards the middle, middle of the mat and then take the right arm up and down and through until the shoulder comes close or to or maybe touches the floor. This is our twist. So with your x-ray goggles on, you can see that your spine is now twisted around. It's not in one direction. Use your core and your arm to lift yourself up and switch sides. Good, core and arm, we'll switch again. <laughs> and then switch. It's always good to do this sort of thing on an empty stomach because we're really moving things around inside our bodies. Last two. Last one. Back to all fours. Slide your hands a little uh, further away from you and then push yourself back into child's pose. Now, this is not a resting child's pose. We're still waking up the back. So reach the hands as far away as you can from you. Grip the mat and then pull your bum away from the torso. Pull your bum to the back of the mat. So we'll get a stretch all the way through. Relaxing the head, relaxing the neck. Good. And come on up, shake it out. We're gonna do this one more time. You can either do it again, seated, or I mean, on your mat, or you can get a chair and do the chair version with me. Okay, so we want to sit on the chair so that our knees are basically in line with our hips. So if that means grabbing a prop like I need to do so that our knees are lifted up, go ahead and grab something. Awesome, so cat cow from the chair. You see I'm sitting right on the edge of the chair here. I've got a nice base of support here for my feet. Resting my hands gently on the chair and then lifting the chest, lifting the heart. That's our cow. Rounding the belly, rounding the back. That's our cat. And moving with your breath between these two shapes. Nice, beautiful breaths to synchronize with each movement. It just feels natural, feels good. Last two. Last one. And then come back to a nice neutral spine. We're going to take Take our left arm up and reach over to the right, exhale. Take the right arm up, reach over to the left, exhale. This is our lateral stretch. One more each side. Great. 
back to our nice neutral position. We're going to make circles with our rib cage. So rolling the ribs around. You got to use your core muscles, your belly muscles. Suck in as you roll back and then release as you roll forward. Just get into it. Make it feel good. Make it big or make it small. Just don't let it hurt. We'll go in the opposite direction. Perfect. Okay, now the twist is going to be a little bit different. That's okay. It's still going to work and still going to give you those same benefits. So take your right hand behind you, just grab the back of the chair. Take the left hand to your right knee and then twist around. So the hips don't move at all. We're only twisting the spine. Big deep breaths, massaging your organs. Good. Exhale, turn your head back first. Then release the body and come back to neutral. Left, left hand, this is your left hand, back behind you. Take the right hand to the outside of the left knee. Twist around, including the head. So you're looking behind you. And release. Good, back to center. Awesome to get out of this one. Just stand up, shake it all off. Awesome. And that's it. That's your back reset. You can do that either on your mat or on a chair. It takes three to five minutes, as many repetitions as feels good. Nice and gentle. Don't do anything that strains you or hurts you. Just use it as an opportunity to get all the kinks out. Until next time, thanks for practicing with me. Namaste.